two legendary investors debating one of the most important business models on earth. If you love tech, stocks, and markets, you'll love this one. Check it out. There's effectively three major cloud vendors that compete with one another, AWS, Microsoft, and GCP or Google Cloud. AWS has $124 billion revenue run rate, Microsoft $120 billion, and Google Cloud $54 billion. AWS, which is slightly larger than Microsoft, is only growing 17% year over year. Microsoft 26% year over year. And Google Cloud is accelerating at 32% year over year. Some say getting closer to 40% growth rate. The big thing I hear from partners and enterprise customers of these cloud services is that many of them, if not all of them, as they scale up, move to a multi-cloud model. So none of them want to be dependent on a single cloud. Many folks started on AWS because AWS was the OG. Back in the day when I was running Climate Corp, I was the largest EC2 user on AWS for about a year and a half, which was their elastic compute cloud service. We were running all these models. Models back then. So a lot of companies that are old school established themselves on AWS very early on. But the outage that happened this week, I think, starts to highlight for folks that they can't and shouldn't have a dependency on a single cloud service provider and will only accelerate the diversification of companies into the other clouds. And so I do think this is actually a very beneficial situation for Microsoft and GCP and to your point, JCal, perhaps even Oracle in terms of giving those sales teams, which are very aggressive, a hard story to go and sell for and say, guys, you don't want to just sit on AWS in case this happens again. We've got better infrastructure, we're more reliable, et cetera, than these other guys. So come and move over to us. And that might be a little bit of a naive, simplistic, kind of reductive way to think about what happened this week. But I, we are seeing the smaller competitors accelerate. And I think that this might be another kind of moment of acceleration for those folks. And multi-cloud, it's been around for a while, Jamath, when you're doing stuff with 8090. Are the big companies already doing that or do they assume, hey, there's going to be some downtime? I think there are two markets. There's the AI market, then there's the non-AI market. In the non-AI market, everybody has everything. It all looks effectively the same. There's certain products and services that are unique to Azure versus GCP versus AWS. But by and large, the market is big enough and important enough that you'd have to be pretty insane to take a single vendor approach. What typically happens in these markets is that they start off really small, one person has all the share, and then as the market becomes very valuable and very big, everybody diversifies because it's a risk management thing. If you didn't have that diversification and something bad happened and it impacted your business, you could get sued. So there's all these reasons why eventually all these three big companies will converge effectively roughly a third, a third, a third. You know, there's this principle called the rule of three, where they say like all markets eventually mature to kind of a 60 30 10 split that you end up having your market leader at 60 percent market share second place is usually half the size at 30 and then you always there's some balance in the market where there's some competitor that resolves to about a 10 percent it's really interesting if you guys were to place a bet who would you think is the 60 30 10 i don't think that um, applies here i think that's bullshit you think they're going to be a third, a third, a third? I think it's all some idiot making something up. But what do you think? What do you think, about, what do you think happens in cloud? Like, do you think that these all converge to equal market share? In non AI, it's a third, a third, a third. It will. It'll take circuitous paths, but that's where we'll end up. By the way, a good point to make is that this revenue number that I highlighted for Google Cloud, Microsoft, and Amazon actually include their applications. I think the way it works in AI is that you initially, right now, we're in this early phase where there's two paths. Path one is you need a specific model and it's relatively well integrated using a specific subsidized form of hardware on one of the hyperscalers. But eventually you'll get more of that abstracted away as it gets pushed into the infrastructure so that you have less dependence on one model. There's a lot of work that has to get done and a lot of in-memory infrastructure that is not yet built that has to exist. But once that exists, it'll be easier for all of us at the application level to view these models a little bit more fungibly. And then at the bleeding edge, you'll have the folks that basically give you some form of a hypervisor or virtual machine or the bare metal. And that's where the neoscalers are doing really well. But I think my point is that in any important market in compute, in technology, where there really isn't much of a differentiation, I think you'll end up with these hyperscalers at a third, a third, a third. Now, if one model is way, way better and it's only on one of the clouds because Google writes a big check or Amazon writes a big check, I could see that swaying 
the AI share. But in the absence of that, I think cheaper, faster, better is sort of the end destination for everybody. What an extraordinary outcome for Amazon, where AWS is like 15% of their revenue right now, Freeberg, but it's 60% of their profits today. And that was just a side hustle, like a little project they took out of nowhere. And it's, it's having the same impact on Google and other places. So side bets point. Yeah. and side quests are just, you look at the Waymo side quest for Google, or even a lot of Sergey's other bets, like and Larry, flying cars, Looms, low earth satellites, Google, Google Fiber, all those X projects were so, had so much potential. And TPU, they, DeepMind, TensorFlow, GFS, uh, Robotics. It's pretty cool. Uh, Boston Robotics, they bought all those robotics companies. Man, it's like somebody got to them and were like, yeah, you know, you're seven, eight years you know, into problem, this, it didn't happen. The problem that Google has, unfortunately, is like they have so much stuff, it's not really value. And so they're going to go through the same problem that everybody else who's a conglomerate has, which is this decision. Now, Buffett, when he got to that decision, said, I don't care. This is my life's work. And so I'm just going to keep everything aggregated. But now you're going to get to this thing where the intrinsic value of everything they have will far exceed the actual value that it trades at. And so there'll always be these fissures of pressure. And then if one of these things requires a lot of money, there'll be pressure. And that pressure will be segregate these things so that I can own one versus the other. So I suspect well, they, that they, I mean, this is yeah, going to happen at Google. This was what they set up to do with Alphabet was to be the holding company. They made that evolution, particularly in a company like Waymo, where they said, we can't be the sole funder. They brought in Silver Lake. They brought in all these other investors. They did this actually with Verily. They did this with a bunch of these what they call other bets. By bringing in outside capital and having an independent board for these subsidiaries, they were actually able to drive better outcomes because now there was governance and there was aligned interests. There's no way somebody as smart as Silver Lake comes in if they think there's not a path to liquidity. So the other thing they have to promise is they're That's like, right. listen, we will take this company public and in return, you will help us build a better company than we could build ourselves. Well, it seems that Silver Lake has done their part of the bargain. Now it's up to Google to live up to their part of the bargain, because if it doesn't get liquid, it sets a very bad precedent for everybody that committed capital into that company. Google has a problem that sounds insane, but is actually real. They're too good at building valuable business. They're not the only ones though. AWS started as a side project at Amazon and now generates 60% of their profits despite being only 15% of their revenue. Google has built equally transformative side bets, TPUs that power AI infrastructure, Waymo leading autonomous vehicles, DeepMind revolutionizing AI research, but these assets are trapped inside a conglomerate structure where the market can't properly value them. Google's TPU chips have the potential to become critical AI infrastructure competing directly with NVIDIA, but that value is completely hidden inside of Google. Chavath mentions TPUs alongside other Google side bets like DeepMind, TensorFlow, robotics, and autonomous vehicles are not really given value in Google's conglomerate. In my opinion, TPUs are one of the most underappreciated assets in tech because they're buried in Google's financials rather than valued separately. These aren't just chips Google uses internally, they're powering a growing portion of AI training and inference workloads across the industry through Google Cloud. When companies train models on Google Cloud, they're often running on TPU infrastructure that competes directly with NVIDIA's GPUs. The economics of TPUs are extraordinary. Google has designed them specifically for AI workloads, making them more efficient than general purpose GPUs for many tasks. They control the full stack from chip design to cloud deployment, which means better margins than competitors buying NVIDIA chips and reselling compute. But all of this value gets lumped into Google Cloud revenue, which itself is mixed with Google Workspace and other services. If TPUs were a standalone company, investors could value it based on the massive AI infrastructure build out happening globally. Instead, it's just a line item contributing to Google Cloud's 32% growth rate, which itself is overshadowed by advertising revenue that's five times larger. The market looks at Google as an advertising company that happens to have a cloud business completely missing that the cloud business contains an AI infrastructure asset that could be worth huge amounts separately. The conglomerate discount is real and painful. Berkshire Hathaway has often traded below the sum of its parts. General Electric eventually broke up. When you have multiple valuable businesses under one roof, the market can't properly value each piece because they're all blended together. This creates the pressure that Tremarf describes. As TPUs become more valuable and more critical to AI infrastructure, there will be calls to spin it out or at least report it separately so the market can value it properly. Same with Waymo and many other of Google's bets. And then we have the cloud market share battle, which just had a massive recent accelerant. 
The AWS outage just handed Microsoft and Google the perfect ammunition to steal enterprise customers by proving that single cloud dependency is an unacceptable risk that could kill your entire business. Freeberg explained that AWS is at a $124 billion run rate, Microsoft $120 billion, and Google at $54 billion, with AWS growing the slowest at 17%, Microsoft at 26% and Google Cloud at 32% year over year. Freeberg also mentions that partners and enterprise customers are moving to multi-cloud models because none of them want to be dependent on a single cloud. The AWS outage isn't just a technical failure, it's now a sales weapon that competing clouds will use for years. Every enterprise CTO who watched their business go offline while AWS was down now has to answer uncomfortable questions from their board about why they had a single vendor dependency. This matters because cloud migration decisions are sticky. Once you build your infrastructure on one provider, moving is expensive and time consuming. Companies stayed on AWS not just because it was arguably clearly better or maybe it's worse, but because switching costs were high and if it ain't broke, don't fix it but the outage just broke it, which gives CTOs justification to spend money on diversifying. Microsoft and Google sales teams already had the multi-cloud pitch, but it was mainly theoretical. What if AWS goes down wasn't compelling when AWS had been reliable? Now it's not hypothetical, it happened, and every CTO remembers exactly how bad it felt watching their services offline with no control. That emotional memory is worth a lot. Public companies have to disclose material risks. If you're 100% dependent on AWS, and that dependency could tank your business if AWS fails, you have to tell shareholders. Once it's disclosed as a risk, you're on the hook to mitigate it. The outage just proved the risk is real, not theoretical, which forces action. Sales is about creating urgency. Before the outage, selling multi-cloud was logical but not urgent. Now there's a burning platform. Pre-outage, there's an argument saying that staying on a single cloud is a viable offense for CTOs. Picture this, a potential client searches for what your business offers and your YouTube video appears. Before they've even booked a call, they've built trust with you, turning them into a warm lead. That's why our clients are hitting $100,000 months, because YouTube turns attention into authority. If you run a business, book a call, and I'll show you exactly how to make this happen.